My name is Nirav Shaw, and I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I am joined this afternoon by Commissioners Jean Lambrew of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services and Commissioner Pender Macon of Maine's Department of Education. And we are all here to provide an update on all things COVID-19 across the state of Maine for today, Tuesday, September 1st, 2020. Right now in the state of Maine, there are 4,548 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 22 cases from yesterday. Of those cases, 4,081 are confirmed and 467 are probable. 421 individuals has been, have been hospitalized at some point, and nine individuals are currently in the hospital with COVID-19, five of whom are in the ICU and one of whom is on a ventilator. 132 individuals have passed away with COVID-19, the same number that has been in place for several days now, and 3,945 have recovered an increase of 22 recoveries since yesterday. Among our cases are 982 healthcare workers. I'd like to now provide an update on some of the outbreaks that Maine CDC is currently focused on. Let's start with the outbreaks that have been associated with a wedding in Millinocket that took place a few weeks ago. Overall, inclusive of all of the subsequent outbreaks linked to that wedding, there are 134 cases associated with the August 7th Millinocket wedding. I'm just gonna break down what those 140, 134 cases are comprised of. 56 of those 134 are guests that attended the wedding itself, as well as their secondary and tertiary contacts. One of those individuals was the secondary contact of a guest as, and happens to be a staff member at Maplecrest. In addition, there were are 11 other Maplecrest staff, excluding the one that I mentioned, as well as residents at Maplecrest. There's also been a case among one staff member at the York County Jail who attended the wedding. In addition, there have been 18 other staff members at York County Jail as well as 38 inmates at the York County Jail. In addition to that, there have been five family members of staff members at the York County Jail. All inclusive, there have been 66 total cases associated with the York County Jail. Of these 134 cases, 11 of them are probable cases and 123 are confirmed. Our investigation into this nexus of cases is ongoing. And as we learn more about the dynamics, as well as the additional cases that we've learned about, we'll make sure we keep everyone updated. I'd like to now provide an update on some other outbreaks that are ongoing within York County. One is at the Calvary Baptist Church in Sanford, where there remain five cases of COVID-19 associated with that church. And finally, at the Sanford Fire Department, as well as associated fire departments in and around York County, there remain a total of four cases. Turning now to colleges and universities. In the past day, Maine CDC has opened epidemiological investigations on two college campuses associated with cases of COVID-19. At the University of New England, We've opened an investigation in partnership with the university after reports of three confirmed cases of COVID-19 at that campus. And at the Maine Maritime Academy, similarly, we've opened an epidemiological investigation after, confirmed, after three confirmed cases associated with the Maine Maritime Academy. Both of those outbreak investi I'm sorry, both of those epidemiological investigations have been opened just in the past day. And so they are just now getting underway. As we learn more about both of those situations, we will make sure we keep everyone up to date. I'd like to turn now to some updates around testing. Let's first start with positivity rates. Based on 5,788 
PCR test reported to Maine CDC yesterday. The one day point positivity rate in Maine yesterday was 0.4%. That brings our seven day PCR positivity rate to 0. Excuse me, 0.60%. That's about the lowest that it's been in quite some time, certainly since we've started tracking the numbers. That's a positive sign. I'd also like to take a moment to comment on the testing volume. Right now in Maine, the testing volume for PCR tests is at 333 tests per 100,000. To put that number in perspective, that represents an 88% growth in testing volume in the past 30 days and a 54% growth in testing volume just in the past 10 days alone. We are continuing to work to expand our testing capacity and with it, our testing volume across the state, not just at the main CDC lab, but also working in concert with other laboratories that are also offering testing within the state. And finally, a quick note about the number of test results among individuals from out of state. As of right now, across the state of Maine, there have been 231 test results among individuals who have listed another state as their primary place of residence. Just to be clear on that number, that's not 231 individuals, that's 231 test results. As we've talked about at these meetings, some individuals may be tested multiple times at the direction of their healthcare provider. That 231 number is the number of test results, not the number of individuals. To provide a little bit of context around that number, the number of test results among individuals just in Penobscot County is 263. And, and I, I should have been more clear, but just for, for to make sure I am, that's 231 positive test results out of a total of 7,486 results overall among individuals who have listed another state as their primary place of residence. So with that, I'd like to now turn things over to Commissioner Lambert. Thank you. Today, the Maine Department of Health and Human Services is issuing new guidance to assist nursing facilities in testing their residents and staff for COVID-19. This testing capacity will be enhanced by the federal government's release of more than $10 million in funding and its distribution of point of care testing devices to Maine's nursing homes. The department is also announcing that it is helping nursing facilities address, address staffing challenges by launching a new online tool to connect them with qualified job applicants. Maine CDC already offers universal testing of nursing facility residents and staff in the event of a single confirmed case of COVID-19. We have also worked with several facilities to support their choice to proactively test staff and residents. Now, all nursing facilities must develop plans for proactive surveillance testing that meets the new federal criteria that came out from the federal government last week. The plans are due to Maine Department of Health and Human Services by September 15th. Nursing facilities will have four options for staff testing. First, they can send the samples to our state lab for testing. Second, they can send samples to private commercial labs for testing. Third, small nursing facilities with fewer than 75 staff can arrange for their staff to be tested through one of our 27 swab and send sites. And fourth, the nursing facilities can use these new federally provided point of care antigen testing devices to conduct staff testing. Regardless of which option a facility chooses, Maine CDC will continue to stand by to offer universal testing of nursing facility staff and residents through our state lab in the event of a single confirmed case. To help nursing facilities address, address staffing challenges, the department is also launching Connect to Care, a new portal where facilities can connect with qualified job applicants. We are testing the portal with a small number of nursing facilities now and plan to make it available to all nursing facilities shortly. Connect to Care is offered at no charge in partnership with Advancing States, 
a national organization of state aging and disability agencies. We expect to expand the portal to additional long-term care settings in the near future. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Shaw for questions. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Um, we will now turn to our colleagues in the media. Commissioner Macon, Commissioner Wambrew and I are happy to take any questions they've got. And today's first question goes to Bob Evans from New Center. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, this is for you. Has your staff been able to figure out if patient zero at the Millinocket wedding is from Penobscot County or York County yet? Or at least do you have any idea whether the virus traveled north or south? Um, Bob, that's a, a good question. We've, we've, of course, in any outbreak situation, we're always trying to figure out two things. Where did the outbreak start from and then who might it pass on to? Looking upstream, looking downstream. At this time, our belief is that the direction of transmission was from Penobscot County down to York County. Uh, I don't wanna so much comment on the exact mechanics of patient number one, patient number two, uh, out of fear for revealing potentially private health information. But at this time, uh, the, data the data suggests that the direction of transmission was from Penobscot County down to York County. Okay, thank you. Um, this can be for any of you. Uh, school began in many communities today and students and their parents who are connected to band and choir programs want to know why their programs seem to be have different guidelines or restrictions than some high school sports. Uh, maybe I'll begin and say that all along our process has been to work with the Department of Education, which has on its website six requirements for all school and then recommendations. When it comes to certain types of activity where there might be a greater risk of uh, spreading droplets or projecting air that might create a greater risk of transmission. So in the guidance document that's posted on the Department of Education website, there are some limits on band and singing and other types of activities that do project um, volume. That same guidance document does have limits on physical education classes, which are mandatory for all children. It includes all types of children. It's not just for those who volunteer to do it. That does ensure that there's separation when children in physical education classes are um, exercising. Uh, we are working with the Maine Principals Association, as well as the school superintendents and the school boards to try to uh, to, to work on guidance for school athletics that ensures that children get the experience of physical and emotional and social benefits of sports, but do, but do so safely because we really do have to remember at a time of COVID-19, which is a highly contagious disease, we need to be extra careful. Last week, the Maine Principals Association did vote on a set of guidelines they also sent us those guidelines and asked us for input. We are providing that input to them, also asking them to take into account the concerns that have been raised by other groups as we try to land on a set of guidance for sports that both taps into the benefits of sports while keeping those students, schools, and their families safe. Great, thanks, Bob. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Ashley Blackford at WAGM. Ashley, we'll come back to Ashley in just a moment while we turn to Kevin Miller at the Press Herald. Great, thank you very much. Uh, first, a, a question for uh, for you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, looking at the uh, the uh, wedding outbreak, have you been finding that that you've been getting good cooperation uh, with the various groups? Um, you know, as far as doing the contact tracing, um, especially and. Uh, and can you talk a little bit more about the whether there's potential link between the Sanford um, Baptist Church um, cases and 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 the uh, the wedding as well? Sure. Um, so, uh, Kevin, what, what I will I'll share is that we have had great cooperation with so many of the folks that have been associated with the wedding, either direct guests, 
secondary, tertiary, now quaternary contacts. So we, we have been able to touch base with them. And because of that trust and their trust in us, we've been able to learn about some of the dynamics that have unfolded. Uh, of course, a lot of that credit goes to the main CDC contact tracing team that have been able to put these pieces of the puzzle together to reveal the picture that we've now got. Uh, contact tracing is tough and it entails trusting the person who calls you and says they're from the health department. It entails trusting them with information about who you've been in contact with. And I'm thankful that we've had that degree of trust here in Maine. Uh, you, you noted the connection or the potential connection between the events in York County as well as in Penobscot County and the Sanford Calvary Baptist Church. We're still investigating if there are any linkages among them. Uh, we have some hypotheses, but as with any scientific endeavor, we've got to have more than just reports and, and unconfirmed uh, notions. We've got to make sure we're getting it from primary verified sources. So until we've, until we've secured that and validated it, I don't want to comment, but we do have some we do have some hypotheses that we're looking into that would connect them. And you've been finding that the uh, contact tracing is going going well with the, the church as well? Um, it, I, th I think it has. You know, we've just opened that investigation. And uh, I think for many members, uh, they, you know, this is this is something new. They they may not have spent much time at the church. Uh, and so they, they, you know, a lot of it has been making sure we're being clear about when we think the transmission may have happened, where it may have been happening. Uh, we want to make sure we're working with anyone who has been potentially exposed uh, as opposed to trying to work against them. So my, my message here is if you happen to be watching right now and you happen to be a parishioner, a congregant at the Calvary Baptist Church, uh, and if you happen to get a call from someone at Maine CDC, please know that our goal here is to work with you to limit the spread of COVID-19. There may be folks in your life who are immunocompromised, who are elderly, or who have chronic medical conditions. We can work with you to make sure that if you were exposed, you put measures in place to reduce the likelihood of spreading COVID-19 to those folks like someone who may be immunocompromised or elderly. So we don't introduce the virus into their households and potentially have further adverse consequences. We're here to work with you to try to keep people safe and healthy. All right. And then a, a follow-up, I don't know if this would go towards you or towards Commissioner Lambert. Um, with the expanded uh, testing capacity that we have now and the CMS requirement on testing uh, of all, universal testing of all long-term care facility staff, you know, uh, we've talked about this in the past, but, you know, any thoughts of, you know, doing universal testing of, of residents of long-term care facilities and kind of what's your latest thinking on, on where, on the pluses and minuses of that? Dr. I'll go ahead and kick it off. Yeah, I'll kick it off. And then uh, Commissioner Lambrew, please. Um, so Kevin, that's something that's been a, a, a you know, a, a constant topic of discussion, not just within our offices in Maine, but nationwide. Um, and as we've been investigating that in Maine, we've talked to medical directors at nursing facilities, many of whom have expressed to us um, reservations is, is maybe the, the right term, maybe um, about, about widespread testing of residents themselves. Uh, many of the residents may have memory issues or dementia, so obtaining consent for testing poses challenges. Uh, the testing itself can involve sticking something up someone's nose, and that in and of itself could be uh, irksome, it could be bothersome, it could even be traumatic. So the other thing we've also learned from many of these nursing facility outbreaks nationwide is that in most all of the settings, the virus is introduced into the facility by the employees through no fault of their own, let me be clear. And so by focusing our efforts on zeroing in on repeated employee testing, we can simultaneously keep residents safe without entering into some of the concerns that medical directors have raised. So that's kind of where we've landed right now. Uh, that obviously all changes the second that there's a confirmed case. The second there's a confirmed case among anyone, we immediately move to testing everybody. But the data from other states, um, such as Connecticut, have shown that by homing in 
on testing staff members, you can simultaneously keep residents safe. I'll add that while we're looking at our expanded lab capacity, we are thinking through what are organizations like nursing facilities. For example, we've had a number of group home outbreaks in the state of Maine during the course of this pandemic. The good news is we're down to maybe one, one of those outbreaks today, but we know that there are other congregate living facility settings. So we are looking as we first do nursing facilities where we have the highest risk, what is the next, the next ring of types of facilities that we could begin to tap into similar types of staff testing to really target those areas that have been challenging during this pandemic. So we are absolutely looking at what are our next opportunities with our expanded lab capacity and hope to have news on that soon. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn back to Ashley Blackford at WAGM. Ashley, are you, are you on? Hi, Dr. Shaw, can you hear me now? Yep, go ahead. Um, we've had some viewers contact us wondering about the recent CDC report um, that stated only 6% of deaths have COVID-19 as the only cause to mention. The other 94% had other conditions and contributing causes. I'm just looking to get your take on this. That the CDC has had up on its website for some time have been interpreted by some to say COVID's not so bad. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm glad you raised this, Ashley, because what these data really show is that COVID behaves in the same way as many, many other viruses, which is to say it opens the door and paves the way for other conditions to take hold in someone who has COVID-19 and then potentially cause adverse events like death. So well, this is how any virus operates, whether it's COVID-19, influenza, or HIV. They weaken the body's immune system or their kidneys or the liver or your heart. And as a result of that weakening, they can then uh, precipitate other health conditions that may have been working in the background or may be brand new that now come to the fore and can lead to death. So no one should be comforted by these numbers whatsoever. Really what they show us is that COVID-19 is as insidious as we thought it was before which is to say it can open this door and then lead to other follow-on conditions. In the case of COVID-19, that might start with pneumonia, but then proceed to a very severe form of pneumonia called respiratory distress syndrome, which in and of itself can cause blood clots and other types of conditions that ultimately can lead to someone to succumbing from the disease itself. So uh, I, I've, I've read the reports and I've read analyses that suggested that COVID-19 may not be as bad as we think, but really what it means is that it operates in just the same nefarious fashion as do other sig significant viruses like influenza, like HIV. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Victoria Bellew at the Countywide Newspaper. Hello, Dr. Shaw. My question today pertains to the length of time of exposure and quarantine. So the guidelines say that to, you should quarantine if you've been in con close contact with someone with COVID-19, um, that you were within six feet of that person for a total of 15 minutes or more. So as schools resume and as people are inside more, I wonder how the guidelines would work if you were in an enclosed space for longer than 15 minutes, even if you were able to maintain the six foot distance. For example, in a classroom, you might be in a room for up to six hours with one or two breaks throughout the day. So does that have a impact? It, it does, Victoria. Um, you know, what we've, we've, we've taken a look at the experience in other states as well as in other countries with students being in a classroom. And what we found is that even if a student may be seated 10 or 20 feet across the classroom from another student, the possibility of interaction within that classroom before class, during class, or after class still exists, even if the students are maintained in a tight classroom pod. For that reason, Maine CDC, in, in working with our colleagues and Commissioner Macon at DOE, uh, our view will be that where there is a single case of COVID-19 within a classroom, all of the students in that classroom will be considered to be close contacts. Uh, we believe that's the safest thing for students we wanna cast a wide net to make sure that we're looking as far and as wide 
for cases of COVID-19 that were providing public health advice to reduce transmission of COVID-19 and that we're also learning from the experience of other states and other countries as they've been opening their schools. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm gonna turn now to Brian Sullivan at WABI. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, my question goes back to the state's dealings with the Maine Principals Association, and I'm not sure who exactly will be best to speak to it, but I'm seeing reports that there's been a letter sent uh, to the MPA that maybe doesn't say no high school sports or uh, sports for, um, for students, but does have some questions about the guidelines that have been laid out by the MPA. I was wondering if you could just give an update or uh, a little insight into that process and where we are. Um, I, I can share that the MPA has reached out to us with their guidance and asked for um, feedback from DHHS and CDC with respect to the health and safety that they put together. And so I think our response was uh, to let them know that there were places where there was great alignment and places where they are quite misaligned with the guidelines that CDC and DHHS have put together. And I'll just Any add specifics that, uh, as to what, I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner. Well, I was just going to say, I think that our approach here has been not to say whether or not there can be school sports, it's more when and how. How do we take each activity and identify both where is possible when there's safety guidance to be able to engage and where there are greater risks? And I think what we've been doing is going through with the Maine Principals Association. Number one, our underlying state policy, because there are policies not specific to either sports or schools that we want to make sure that they know are applicable. Two is ensuring, and we got the agreement on a call earlier today with the Principals Association that the school rules apply. As a reminder, these are not just sports taking place in communities, they're place, taking place on school grounds, in school gyms. So making sure that it's clear that the school rules do apply seems important and we think we share that agreement. And then third, there's this issue of competition. How do you in different levels of risk allow students or sport athletes, as you say, to engage in competition? I think there's still some more discussion and dialogue to be happening on that. This is a challenging topic, not just in the state of Maine, but across the nation and we're hopeful that working together, we can come to some agreement. Thank you. And Dr. Shaw, I would just, uh, going back to the, the sports and the music a little bit, just your opinion or, or thoughts um, on the difference between perhaps a, a young adult or a young uh, person who would play football and perhaps tackle somebody and then someone who would like music and want to sing and the differences between the two things. Sure. So, you know, I, I think I think the way Commissioner Lambrew phrased it is exactly right, which is our focus right now isn't so much on activity X, yes or no, or activity Y, thumbs up, thumbs down. It's to take the activities that we know are important for school children uh, a, a, as part of their development, as part of their socializing, and figure out which of those can be done safely. Uh, and the public health job here is to try to think through what the risks are, what parameters we can put into place, irrespective of whether it's sports, whether it's singing, whether it's band practice, they've all got features that introduce risk. They all have features that may be protective. So we're not looking to take a blanket approach to any of these. We're trying to take them piece by piece to see in what manners they could potentially be done safely. If so, then great. If not, then where do we go from there? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to turn to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much for taking my question. And thanks for the update on the Millnocket outbreak. So just going back to that a little bit and talking about the York County Jail. So the total there is now 66. So with that large of an outbreak, has it been mandatory for the guards and the inmates to wear PPE like masks? And how can they really protect themselves? ended in partnership with the Department of Corrections, um, that staff members within that facility as well as inmates all be wearing face masks, face coverings as is appropriate for their position. Uh, would refer you to the jail itself in terms of implementation, but what we recommend in any kind of setting where individuals are in close contact with one another, be it a jail, be it a 
uh, you, you name it, any kind of setting of that nature, we recommend face coverings where possible, in this case, at all times, to make sure that the risk of transmission of the virus is as minimal as it can be. So I guess, so it hasn't been made mandatory there? Um, I, we have strongly, strongly recommended it. Um, I don't know that it's, I guess, you know, it's, it's been a very, very strong public health recommendation. Um, so in that sense, yes, we, we, we absolutely believe that it's the right thing to do for public health, as well as to reduce the likelihood of transmission. I know Great, that there have you. been, you bet. Uh, I am going to turn next over to Evan Pop at the main beacon. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on, on the York County Jail line of questioning. Um, is there any plan to um, issue any more recommendations um, or to make it um, clear to prisons and jails across the state that that is the at least strong recommendation of the CDC to, to wear um, masks at all times? Yep. So this is, Evan, I'm, I'm glad you raised this. Um, this has not been a new recommendation whatsoever. Uh, this has been a recommendation that's been in place. We've recommended it to any setting where there might be close contact among individuals. We have recommended face coverings as a bedrock public health principle going back several months now. Uh, so it's been a very strong recommendation for any group of individuals, be they in a county jail, in an office building like where I am right now. We think that's just good public health practice. In any outbreak setting, on top of things of that nature, we also offer recommendations for things like staggering schedules, getting contact tracing underway, repeated rounds of testing, uh, all of which that the jail is working to implement right now. So, so essentially, it would be sort of um, kind of reminding people of those those old recommendations that are already in place. And that's right, and making sure that we that they have everything they need in order to put them in practice. So one of the first things we do when we get on a call with a facility of any kind that's having an outbreak, pretty much question number one is, what resources do you need that we can help provide to you? Do you have resource requests for the state of Maine? And if what they need in order to engage or furnish masking for uh, to ensure universal masking is more masks, then that's what we focus on getting them. And that's one of the first questions our team asks, even before we get on a call, is what resources do you need and when and how can we get them to you? Great. Um, and I just have another question on a, a slightly different topic. Um, so given what we know about asymptomatic spread, um, it seems clear that practices like surveillance testing of populations and uh, wastewater testing can help um, identify and control outbreaks and organizations like universities and, and sports leagues across the country are already doing that. Um, so I'm wondering if Maine has any plan to um, scale up these kind of practices statewide, or are we um, going to continue um, to test only the symptomatic individuals and their contacts? Oh, uh, so Evan, I want to make sure I'm very clear with you. Um, going back several months now, going back three months now, our recommendation has not been just to test symptomatic individuals. We have recommended testing of asymptomatic individuals going back several months now. That's reflected in the standing order that Maine DHHS and Maine CDC issued now two and a half months ago. That standing order very clearly allows for a large category of individuals who may have been exposed and not yet showing symptoms to make sure that they have access to testing uh, by providing them a doctor's order so that they can go get tested. This includes folks like family members of confirmed cases. This includes folks that may have a public facing job that puts them into contact with members of the public. It includes folks that are returning to Maine from travel to high risk countries. It includes folks that may have participated in a large gathering, the list goes on and on. So we are not just recommending testing for symptomatic individuals. We are and have for many months now recommended testing for asymptomatic individuals as well. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to turn now to Stephen Porter at Seacoast Media. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I had a follow-up question about enforcement related matters, specifically as it pertains to religious organizations like Calvary Baptist Church. 
You mentioned earlier this afternoon on Maine Calling that Maine CDC doesn't have the authority to shut down churches. So I guess my question is, who does have at least some enforcement authority over those types of organizations? Is it the York County Sheriff, the Sanford Police Chief, someone else, no one at all? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, Stephen, let me just rewind a bit. Uh, what, I, what I said was Maine CDC doesn't license churches. Uh, and generally speaking, our ability to work with and enforce upon individuals or organizations rather is coextensive with our licensure authority. Um, and so that that was that was what that discussion was. Uh, and where I was getting at was that we just don't license churches. And so what we have been doing with respect to churches is working with them in the same way that we would with any organization that we don't license, which is to say, here are the recommendations, the principles of good public health practice that we recommend that you put into place during Bible school, during your worship services. And we ask them to comply with those recommendations around things like physical distancing, masking, things of that nature. Depending on the reception that we get, then we can work with other organizations. Um, I'll, and I'll turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew from here. But depending on the reception we get to those good public health principles, that sort of determines the enforcement pathway that we potentially might take. So uh, Commissioner, can I turn it over to you? Absolutely. So I do want to separate out again, like the narrow licensing authority that Maine CDC has. We have different agencies in the state that also do license different types of facilities like bars, liquor licenses, et cetera. That's one set of authorities. But under the state of civil emergency with the pandemic, we do have emergency authorities to protect the public health. And to be clear, their authorities only intended to ensure that there's not some sort of action or activity that continues that could, could put people in harm's way. Those types of um, enforcement actions are related. They, they could be a criminal charge. It could be jail time. It could be for individuals, a, penalty, a fine of up to $1,000. It could for an organization be a fine of up to $10,000. Those are authorities that are, to me, enforcement tools that the state does have. Those are primarily used, though, in the event that we know something is going to happen and should it proceed, there's harm that happens. It's not necessarily a retrospective um, penalty that we have in different sorts of circumstances, but we do have those enforcement tools, and as needed, we will use them. And those emanate from the executive orders. Understood. Thank you. A, a quick follow up for the commissioner, if I may. Have those enforcement actions, those tools been used um, with regard to any main churches at this point, or have they been threatened specifically with regard to any main churches? Those enforcement authorities have not to date been used with any main churches. We have on occasion provided education <laughs> when we've heard about events at either you know, religious organizations or non-religious organizations about the rules for a large gathering, the safety precautions that they could take. And to date, when we provided that education, there's been compliance. Thank you. I'm gonna turn now to Dustin at New England Cable News. Hello, I think my first question is for Commissioner Lambrew. Um, that is, from the state's perspective, what was a series of events that led up to the Aquaboggan cease and desist notice? So as with every type of uh, concern that we've gotten from the public, we talk to local health officers, local law enforcement, we investigate, we provide information and education. And if that information and education is not followed, then we go to our next steps. We did consider um, shutting down, for example, their pools, their uh, snack bar, which is part of our licensing scheme, but because that really is a small part of their business, when after repeated engagements with the owners of the facility explaining our guidance, which has been basically the same guidance all summer, while it was updated, it was not changed with regard to these large outdoor gatherings. Uh, we felt we had no choice when after repeated attempts to work with Aquab Aquaboggan to bring them into compliance, they failed to do so. We decided we needed to act. And um, just to follow up on that before I turn to Dr. Shah, if they do want to create policy changes they've sort of alluded to in their Facebook posts, what should they do? Contact DHHS or something like that? 
Sure. We've been in regular contact with them. They know exactly how to engage with the state. We've been encouraging them to work with us on safety protocols that would enable them to be open. But there were, you know, over a thousand people in these sites on any given day with an inability to keep people apart, which as we've seen in different parts of the state, when you have large uncontrolled gatherings, the results can be deadly. And then Dr. Shah, going back to the Calvary Church for a second, we've heard from people living near the physical church worried about cases there. Do we know if these cases at the Calvary Church pose a risk to the general public? What have conversations about safety with the church been like so far? So what we know about cases where, or facilities where there are outbreaks is that in keeping with the discussions we've had around COVID-19 as a whole, which is that the risk to any individual who may live around a facility where there's an outbreak is really dependent on how close you are with anyone in that facility. Um, and generally speaking, we define close as within six feet or at least six, 15 minutes. As a, as a result of that, what we have not seen in Maine or in any other part of the country is follow on cases of COVID-19 among neighbors of say hospitals or nursing facilities, or in this case, churches. So I think the general principles that we recommend in any setting equally apply with respect to neighbors of say Calvary Baptist Church, which is making sure you're wearing face coverings and maintaining six feet of physical distancing at all times. By virtue of living next to a church, there is not an elevated risk. We certainly don't wanna make the church a pariah in that respect. The risk is because of individuals, not because of a building itself. I'm gonna turn now to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shah. You referred a question about whether or not masks were being worn at the York County Jail, uh, back to the jail. Does that mean the CDC is not investigating that? And if the jail is, uh, investigating or reporting on what they're doing themselves. And if they've decided to not follow the recommendations, do this, um, this vulnerable population, the 37 inmates that have been infected in York County, as well as any other inmates at jails across the state have any protections from the public health system use or using the enforcement tools you've been talking about that the Commissioner Lambert was just describing? Sure, Amy. Um, so. What we do in outbreak situations is that we make sure as soon as we detect that there's an outbreak, we get on the phone with the owners, the operators, those who manage whatever facility we're contending with, be it a healthcare setting, a restaurant, a factory, or in this case, a jail. And we provide them, we, we first of course wanna to get to the facts of what's going on. As I mentioned, that entails making sure we know what's up, we ask them if they've got resource requests, and then we try to make sure we, with that understanding of the contours of that facility, are providing the best available public health recommendations. It's then on the facility to make sure they are implementing those recommendations in the best way possible to protect their own staff, to protect clients. We check in with facilities quite frequently to make sure that if they've got additional resource requests, if they've got technical questions, if they need assistance with arranging for testing, we are standing by. But the primary onus of implementing public health recommendations is on the facility itself. We are always checking in with them to make sure that they have an understanding of what those requirements are and that they're able to implement them. But at the end of the day, they manage the facility and they've got to make sure they're putting these recommendations in a pl in, into place with what is it 66 or 67 total cases there? I mean, obviously there was a great deal of spread. So will you not be investigating any further how that happened? Oh no, our invest, definitely not Amy. Please don't characterize uh, that in that fashion. Our investigation is continuing. And in any outbreak investigation, we're always trying to figure out, in, in this sense, in this setting, we've got a good sense of how it was introduced so we've got a good sense of the upstream part, but we're always trying to make sure we have a better understanding of how it may have spread within the facility and what steps can be put into place to limit that transmission. In a setting like a jail, that includes things like making sure masking is in place and 
making sure they've got masks so that clients as well as resident, I'm sorry, employees have masking, and then as well as cohorting so that individuals who have been positive and exposed are not introducing COVID-19 to individuals who have not been exposed at all. Those are the recommendations that we put into, or that we recommend, um, but ultimately it's the facility's responsibility to make sure that they're putting them into place. I have a question on a completely different subject from a listener who wonders with all of the talk that we've heard about uh, air circulation, air conditioning units and so forth, if a ceiling fan in a church or another public gathering place would be something that would be beneficial moving the air around or if that would actually potentially make things more dangerous. What we know about air circulation in in enclosed spaces is that the essence of it is not circulation of air, but exchange of air, actual ventilation. So moving air around in and of itself uh, doesn't really reduce the risk of the virus. The key is exchanging air, exchanging the inside air for the fresh outside air. That movement of air inside to outside through HVAC units, or something as simple as opening a window can reduce the likelihood that virus builds up inside and could be inhaled by somebody else. So the key here is air exchange, not so much air circulation. And again, that can be accomplished by something as simple as opening a window. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to David Ede at WGME. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew and Commissioner Macon. Um, back to the uh, fall high school sports season. Do you folks have any concrete timeline as to when decisions are going to be made? And the reason why I ask is the kids are due to start practicing in one week. Um, and there's just been, it's been a roller coaster for really for everyone. I mean, has that been discussed and what happens next? I think I'll begin and then Commissioner Macon, do you want to, or do you, would you like to go first? Go right ahead. Okay. So just to review the timeline, we have worked aggressively, and I give Commissioner Macon credit. She's been working since the spring with all the stakeholders, schools, school boards, superintendents, teachers, parents, et cetera, on guidance. Uh, our approach to guidance has been to um, fill in the gaps. And while we were working on the educational guidance, we knew from the Maine Principals Association that they were working on school sports. They did ask us questions beginning in mid-August. We responded to their questions. Their guidance itself just came out last Thursday, and it came out within hours of within hours of it coming out. There was the vote, so we did not actually have a chance to weigh in beforehand. They told us before the vote that they would still welcome our guidance. It was a draft. They would appreciate our input and we are providing that input. But we do appreciate the fact that it's September 1st and we know that lots of activity is happening to reopen schools. You know, we do, we did suggest to the Maine Principals Association it might make sense to give it a little bit more time as schools are opening as we try to resolve the concerns that we've given to them. But we're not the only ones. The Maine Superintendents Association, the Maine School Board Association similarly has questions of the sports guidance. So we're hoping with intense work and a little bit more time, we can come to some agreement. And I guess I would only add that uh, we're eager to open schools up safely and very carefully. And we recognize how important sports and music and all of the other programs that um, enrich students and their educational trajectories are very important to us. But um, we we definitely wanna make sure that we are opening schools very safely in these early beginning weeks and until we're ready with that guidance and it's clear and it's consistent and it all matches, I think we are um, we are gonna recommend that we put that off until such time that we have crystal clear guidance for everyone. Okay, thank you all very much, appreciate it. Sure thing, Dave, we're gonna turn now to John Wagner at ABC7. Uh, well, come back to John while we go to Charlie at the BDN. Yep. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I want to go back to the jail, and I know this has been discussed sort of already, but just to be clear with um, the introduction of COVID-19 to the jail, uh, A, do you um, 
has Maine CDC established that the employee who attended the wedding um, in the Millinocket area, that they introduced the virus to the jail? And then have you determined whether there are any other factors at the jail that contributed to its spreading? Um, so, yep, Charlie, as to the former question, based on everything we have available to us today, uh, we believe that a, the, a an employee who attended the August 7th wedding uh, was responsible for bringing it in to the York County Jail. Uh, I say that based on the timeline of events, based on when individuals began showing symptoms, things of that nature. Um, one, one side note, Charlie, and then I'll get to the other part of your question. It's really important in outbreak investigations not to develop tunnel vision. Uh, all too often in, in outbreak investigations, folks can settle upon a theory and then forget that there could have been other possible modes of introduction into the jail. So that's based on what we know and believe right now. But as I was saying with Amy, the investigation is continuing and we may discover that around the same time, another staff member was also feeling sick who had been at a completely different event. So I don't wanna foreclose those other possibilities. We're always keeping our eyes open to them, not make, making sure we try not to develop tunnel vision. Uh, and then with respect to things that may have contributed to the, to the increase of cases there, uh, that's part of the fact, that's part of the features of our investigation. Uh, so I think right now, Charlie, given that we're still in the mix of things, it's probably too early to comment. We're still developing more facts. One of the things that we've, we have zeroed in on is uh, we do have some concerns that face covering wearing may not have been what we would have recommended it to be. But to be candid, we're still getting more facts around that right now. Um, okay, and then um, just another question that's sort of been asked in different ways, but um, uh, has um, has Maine CDC issued any other citations or any other kind of sanctions to anyone in connection, well, to any, I guess I should say, individuals or uh, organizations in connection with the Millinocket wedding outbreak? In connection with the Millinocket wedding outbreak, uh, the answer is no other than the imminent health hazard and then licensure suspension and then reinstatement at the Big Moose Inn. That was the that was right up until right now the the main focus of our enforcement effort. Uh, we're looking at other avenues, but that's the one that we've undertaken thus far. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Mm -hmm. Going to go back to John Wagner at ABC Seven. All right, are we in this time? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, Dr. Shaw, thank you very much. Um, my question, I believe, would go to uh, Commissioner Lambrew, and this is in regards to the community support guideline update uh, that was released today. You mentioned um, previously that you were uh, awaiting the MPA's guidance to update those community support guidelines. Um, kind of what went into that decision, and was there ever any consideration to update it ahead of that, uh, their, the release of their guidelines and protocols for a return to competition? Sure. So we, in in respect for Maine Principals Association, they were doing their work. They were working off of the midsummer update for our community sports guidance, and we wanted to let them do their work. Um, when we got their document, we decided it was time for us to update our community sports guidance so we could both benefit from their work as well as make sure that we were current. There are a couple changes to that community sports guidance. There was a reassessment of the relative risk of different sports. So as I mentioned previously, soccer, we had previously thought it might be a high risk activity. In consideration, looking at how it's played out, we think it could be medium risk. That's one example. I think we tried to clarify when masks or face coverings can be worn during sports. I think there are some sports where you actually could wear face coverings, which would offer an additional layer of protection. Uh, I think we also clarified guidance on road races, which have been missing. So we wanted to like let the main principles association process unfold and not drop something new in the middle of it. But now that they've done and turned to us again for guidance, we updated our community sports guidance and we recommend that they look at it as well as main principles association and the school boards. Thank you for that answer. And just a, a quick follow-up on that one. Do you feel that um, if possibly those 
had been your update that came out today had been released ahead of that August 27th, I believe it was the, their meeting. Um, do you think it would have made their decision easier in the way that they released their guidelines or was it always the plan to have that come out after they released their potential protocols? So I think you have to ask them if it made it harder or easier for them. We were trying to be respectful of process. Pulling back, we do update our guidance frequently um, because the science changes. We learn things. We want to make sure it really is um, the most finely tuned to the circumstances that we're studying. So it's not at all a surprise that we're updating these guidance doc documents. We probably could, if we had more team, do them frequently, but we also recognize that doing frequent guidance changes also creates some problems as stakeholders try to read them, understand them, implement them, and then act. So we have tried to set a cadence for those updates that make some sense. So we're hopeful that, again, with the, the revised guidance with our suggestions that we made today, looking at, again, the guidance suggestions from other organizations, Maine Principals Association has what it needs to think through how it addresses concerns and works with us all to make school sports safe. Understood. And uh, one final uh, question, and I'll return my time. Um, in the in those updated guidelines, I just briefly scanned over it a couple minutes ago, and it mentions um, a recommendation against uh, road races, uh, half marathons, and things like that. Um, how can that guidance be applied to a um, cross country race? Which is, I think, one of the questions that's come up already. Sure. So I do think that there is, um, you know, some language in the new guidance about. Uh, racing, running with separation. Some sports have lanes, for example, where you really can create a lane that is distant enough that there really can be safe running. But in other events, it's diff more difficult. I think this is community sports guidance, excuse me, community guidance. It's not necessarily school sports guidance. So it is more difficult for any of us who've run in 5Ks or marathons to keep that kind of distance. There's packs, that's actually a term of running that um, happens. So I think there was a greater concern about these uh, community organized road races. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Langer. Thank you. And the last question for the afternoon goes to Patty White from Maine Public. Thanks very much, Dr. Shaw. I've got a question related to the outbreak at the Calvary Baptist Church. Um, it held the church health services this weekend, even though there is an outbreak. Can you just tell us, is that permitted? And does the state know whether the church is following safety guidelines when they hold services? Facilities um, in this fashion, you know, our, our goal is not necessarily to shut them down, but to make sure they can continue doing what they do, utilizing best practices in mind. In, in connection with that, we did have a call with with the pastor at the of the church on Friday afternoon. Again, made sure we understood all the facts, asked if they had any resource requests, and then provided the best available public health guidance to make sure that they were keeping all of their congregants and parishioners safe. Um, I'm not sure. You know, we 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 check in with members of the, each of these facilities on an ongoing basis while we are investigating outbreaks. I can't speak firsthand as to whether things like face covering and physical distancing were recommended or abided by. Um, that's one of the purposes as to why we continue to check in so we can get information from the management, from the owners, operators as to how they're doing. If we learn that there are not recommendations in place or that these measures are not being implemented, then we can go down some of the routes that Commissioner Lambrew outlined earlier uh, to make sure that anyone who is convening events of this sort is doing so in a manner that stays safe. That's why we keep in touch with these facilities as they are working through the outbreaks. But it's also a reason we like to make sure we're contact tracing so that if individuals are starting to experience symptoms, they know where they can get tested. Or if they live with individuals who are immunocompromised, they're being given advice on making sure they limit their interaction so they don't spread COVID-19 to those individuals in their household. Working with organizations like this is always a partnership. We're trying to get to the right result so that we're doing the best, what's, uh, doing what's best for everyone. Great, thanks. And then um, the state had a series of vaccine catch-up clinics this summer. 
Um, can you just tell us what the use was like and um, have childhood vaccination rates improved? I don't know if you've got the data yet. So yeah, that's a, a great question, Patty. Uh, the, the clinics were a success. Uh, they were organized by our public health nursing program, working with local partners on the ground. Um, and, and there were a number of them across the state specifically designed to make sure that parents had the easiest route possible to get their kids back up to date. And they were very successful. Patty, we'll get you the exact numbers of how many clients were served at each one and, and, then, and in the aggregate. Um, it's too early to tell exactly whether those clinics made the difference in turning Maine's numbers around. Uh, but to level set, what we've seen over the course of the pandemic is that nationwide, as well as in Maine, rates of childhood vaccination fell off. Going into the, the catch-up clinics, what we saw in the data was that although there was a, a drop-off for all grades, somewhat interestingly and somewhat surprisingly for us, the drop-off was the most significant among adolescents. Parents had been very diligent about taking their youngsters, their toddlers, and their infants to the pediatrician's office to keep those kids up to date. Although they had fallen, it wasn't as dramatic a fall as it was for adolescents. So we really worked to get the message out to parents to bring not just their youngsters in, but their adolescents in particular. Uh, and that's really where we wanted to focus our effort. We're eager to see what the data look like in the next round to see if we've made an impact there. But that's really where we're focusing a lot of our effort right now. And I will just add that we did announce pre uh, recently that we are providing incentive payments to primary care providers for those pediatricians, for all those health, health providers out there. We recognize this extra work to get children to come in for their well child visits, to give them counseling, to give them these immunizations. So for the next four months, we are providing an extra little amount per month for our healthcare providers in Maine to really work to get those children in to get them caught up. Great. Uh, thanks for that question though, Patty. And again, we'll get you some data on the catch-up clinics. Uh, big thanks to our public health nursing team for organizing those, working with our immunization colleagues. Um, so with that, everyone, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone for tuning in today. There is, as always, quite a lot going on in the world of COVID-19, so many moving pieces. I'd like to thank Commissioner Macon and Commissioner Lambrew for their partnership with Maine CDC and for joining everyone today. As always, please take kind and please be kind and take care of one another. We will look forward to chatting again on Thursday.